New York City, it's your mayor, Eric Adams. Welcome to the Get Stuff Done cast. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone. Really excited about our next episode of Get Stuff Done cast. I'm on now today with Shepard Fairway, a street artist, activist, and founder of Obey Clothing. We want to really discuss the importance of of public art, uh, particularly uh, in underserved communities. For the history of street art and hip hop and the Beastie Boys murals Shepard is doing uh, for the city of New York. Uh, and we just love that street art. You know, when I was ball president, we did a couple of murals uh, throughout the city. And you know what I found uh, interesting is that when groups of different culture, ethnicities all come together and do a mural, it just brings a different level of energy. And so I want to thank you for what you have done. And I want to get into some of the stuff you have done. But tell me about Obey. What is the meaning of that name? Well, um, one of the things that I noticed when I started making street art was that people had a lot of questions. What is it? Why are you doing it? And I thought, yeah, it's great that people are asking questions, but how can I make it um, even more provocative, get them to ask the right questions? And I, I saw a movie called They Live and the word obey was used in it. <laughs> um, also, there was a, an artist that I really liked who used a lot of typography, Barbara Kruger and her work. And I thought, what is something that people do, whether it's a response to a, a, you know, a written rule, a social convention, a, a fear of, of being um, out, of, out of step with things and being judged? They, you know, they obey or they, or they follow the path of re- least resistance. And I, I felt that using the word obey to get people to confront that idea and say, what do I want to obey? What do I want to submit to? What do I believe in? It could set off a chain reaction that could make people more analytical and, um, and find more precise purpose in their lives. I love that. I love that. And I remember that movie. I've seen that, <laughs> seen that big sign. Obey, obey. And now um, when you think about it, art is powerful. You know, it could motivate, it could infuriate, it could instigate, it could just really compel us to lean into our discomfort because being stagnant and comfortable is a sign of of really not growth and healthy discomfort can really take us to another evolution. You know, my my, uh, trainer used to say, no pain, no gain. (laughs) Uh, what inspired you to use art as a form of communication? Well, from the time I was a kid, I, I really enjoyed just the technical process of making art, but I also found it was incredible therapy for mm. whatever stresses I had with my schoolwork or socially um, when I was drawing and painting or later making homemade T-shirts and things like that. Um, you know, all of my... all. all all of my, my insecurity, um, all my anxiety would, would evaporate for that moment while I was making the art. And then I realized that art is a really great tool of communication that people respond to emotionally. It gives people a sense of, of pride and empowerment. And um, it's a social tool. It allows people to share with other people. And finding, you know, um, finding connection to people is really important to human beings. So all of that motivated me, but to be, you know, a little bit more specific, um, I saw how musicians like Bob Marley, The Clash, Public Enemy, Bob Dylan, um, Bikini Kill, Patti Smith, were using, were using art, people, you know, in lots of genres, were using their music, their art form, as a way of conveying ideas through something that was enjoyable to experience. And I thought visual art should do more of that. Mm-hmm. I want to do that with visual art. And, um, and I had, I had role models in, um, a few different artists, artists from, you know, Ro- Robert Rauschenberg did things for, for Earth Day. Barbara Kruger did things around social justice. A guy named Robbie Canal out in LA was doing political things. But, um, you know, I thought I'd like to do that with art, but I loved the spirit of graffiti. So <laughs> graffiti, um, you know, not going through the bureaucracy being people saying I exist and I might be told that I should be powerless and in the margins, but I want to find a way to express myself. That was really meaningful to me. 
you know, I, I mean, there's, there's lots of emotions people feel about graffiti. You know, some people feel it's vandalism, but I, I always thought in certain places it was, it was appropriate and it was a sign of, um, you know, uh, humanity's desire to say, I exist just like, you know, a flower mm. growing through a crack in the sidewalk. Mm. Mm. But, um, but yeah, yeah. But for me, art is a, is a way to connect my ideas with people through, you know, a, a medium that they, they might actually ponder and not reject instantly. Sometimes I think that for other forms of media, people say, uh, that sounds like a talking point that I don't identify with as a, Democrat, Republican, this race, that race, this religion, that religion. Art sometimes is able to get through those barriers. Well said. And and the what do you what do you hope uh, people walk away with after seeing one of your pieces? Well, at the very least, I hope that they um, that they consider the power of art. Um, I do a lot of art in public spaces, and I think that. There should be more art in public spaces because it enriches communities. But for someone to look at a piece of art and say, oh, that person wants to say something. What are they trying to say? What does it make me feel? How do I feel about the way it looks? Uh, you know, all the different dynamics that go into it. But with my work, it's frequently about social justice. So I hope they see not only in my art, but in their lives, some the possibility of making people think about a better path forward. And so what I'm doing a lot of times is not just to say on a soapbox, here's what I think, listen to me. It's also to say, um, you have within you know, your power ways to communicate, ways to shape the world. You're not powerless and powerless people frequently are, are unhappy. So I want my art to be about empowerment. We often talk about the uh, physical nourishment of our bodies on making sure we eat a well-balanced, healthy meal. And we fail, fail to realize the emotional nourishment of we need uh, art, uh, we need colors, we need uh, sounds uh, to make sure we have a balance of uh, mental uh, nourishment at the same time and your art contributes to that because you were able to capture something in your Obama poster uh, that said a lot. It really broke the norms because you were using colors and images that traditionally was not part of a presidential campaign and it put you on a, a international level. People actually define the campaign by your, that hope poster. How did that come about? Well, I, I was really inspired by Obama. I was inspired by this, his 2004 um, DNC speech and then started to follow him a bit. And when he announced his candidacy, I thought, oh, it'd be great to do something for him. I had a friend who had a connection to the campaign. And I thought maybe because I'd been arrested for street art and done some things critical of the Iraq war that my support might not be wanted. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that the Obama campaign was okay with me making something, but I did it just as a grassroots tool of, of activism. And I made it, um, they said, they said, yeah, we know your work. We're, we're fine with you doing that. And, um, and I, you know, I made it based on what I saw as Obama's challenges, which were that he wasn't really well established as a, you know, as a, as a politician that um, he, um, he was half black. This is, uh, you know, unfortunately in our society, this creates, an, you know, an additional challenge for him. So I, I looked at portraying him as somebody with vision, as sort of a two-dimensional sculpture, somebody that's validated by the style of the rendering and someone who's in, um, you know, red, white, and blue in patriotic colors equally, um, e you know, equally legitimate for a leader, for a politician. And I looked at all, all of those things as, um, you know, subtle things to convey, but important things to convey. And when I, when I did it, I thought, okay, it needs to be different from most political imagery, but it also needs to be 
safe enough to to not be you know seen as 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 radical or frightening. And luckily, it seemed to, to strike a chord with people and find the necessary balance to feel you know appealing as different, but also um, say, approachable. And what's fascinating is that life isn't black and white. There's so many shades of not only gray, gray, blues, orange, purples. And the poster for me, it represented uh, the complexities of our emotions and um, what we feel. And people always want to place us into corners and say either you are for this or against that, when in fact, there are just so many shades. And that's what I saw in the poster. And I'm pretty sure everyone who saw the poster may have saw different things. But I walked away with the large word of hope, which was his signature, and the complexity of, of life. Life is, is complex. Well, the um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, which it, it plays right into what you're talking about, is that when, when Obama said in his, the speech that really you know, put him on most people's radar, we're not red states, we're not blue states, we're the United States, I wanted to have... Um, use red, white, and blue, and have the red and blue converge in the middle of his face, and um, showing that that you know we're this polarization that we're you know that we're dealing with is really unhealthy because most people have views that um, you know maybe align with one party more than the other, but nobody you know pe- people aren't monolithic, right? And um, and so also in order to create the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, you know, compromise and understanding the the vast you know variety of of needs of a of a society is really important. So what you know what you're talking about is right up my alley, and I'm amazed that you know you you got that because it was definitely intended. The excitement of doing um, one of my heroes, Nelson Mandela. You did a, a, a twenty two thousand one hundred seventy four square feet uh, image of Nelson Mandela. I was when I was in South Africa and went over and saw this small prison cell and hard floor that he slept on. I always think about it. How did it feel doing that mural? Well, I mean, Mandela is an amazing inspiration. Um, and I, I, you know, I put him up there with, uh, with Martin Luther King, Gandhi, um, and to get to do that mural in Johannesburg, um, as as an American, to have that opportunity was a, was really incredible. And to you know um, go to Soweto and 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 you know go and hang out and see the house that he originally grew up in, and and go and uh, and and have a meal with the guys that own the clothing store that brought Chuck D in to do a performance. Um, you know, it was really, it was really special for me. And, um, and then just to, to hear perspectives traveling for me has been a very important part of, um, just seeing, you know, seeing how other people live, see how, seeing how they, they, they think and expanding my empathy. So, um, yeah, it's an incredible, incredible honor to do those things. I, I don't take it lightly at all. And even the, you know, the inclusion of, um, some of the desert flowers and the pattern in the background were, um, symbolic of, of, uh, of resilience through very, very challenging circumstances. You know, that's a, a flower that grows with a, you know, in hot sun with little water. And so the sim, all the symbolism is stuff that I take seriously and I want to make sure that. I am being um, really thorough about my research of the local culture so that I can participate in a way that actually will connect with the locals. People know your, your, your glory and what you have done in some of the great pieces. Uh, you know, the, the, those, that's the fruit that we see on the tree. Uh, but tell me the roots. Like, what's your story? How did you get here? Did you grow up in New York City? Uh, were your mom and dad uh, artists? Like, what's, what's the roots that keeps you connected? Well, I'm actually from South Carolina, and my mom was head cheerleader and my dad was captain of the football team. 
And um, I, I grew up, you know, solidly middle class, but I did, there was something about preppy culture that didn't sit well with me. And um, I discovered skateboarding and punk rock and then hip hop when I was in high school. And these were very rebellious, creative cultures. Um, my best, I started making homemade t-shirts and stickers when I was in high school. Um, and that was a way for, you know, for me to have a cultural connection to some of the things that I, I loved sharing, sharing bands and imagery that I liked with friends with what I was wearing, which eventually played into me starting my own fashion line. But then it also played into when I um, went off to art school in Rhode Island and started coming to New York because my best friend was going to NYU, seeing the graffiti and picking up on the spirit of that, but wanting to do it in my own way where I, you know, I'm making t-shirts that I'm taking to boutiques, but I'm always also making stickers and stencils that I was putting up on the street. And a lot of that came out of me feeling that um, a, a, a society that's almost like I came from in, in South Carolina, a culture that's almost saying, this is what your background is. So this is what your future is felt stifling. And I wanted to explore a little more than that. And, uh, you know, New York city gives you a lot of opportunities <laughs> for that. Uh, your mom and dad, are, are they still with us? Yeah. And they, um, you know, we, we've, we were far apart for a while and I've, um, I've, I've become a lot more appreciative of everything they did for me. And they've become a lot more understanding of my vision as an artist. So we're very close now. Yeah. And that's an interesting cycle with families. You know, you, not all families, but I find when I talk, speak with close friends, they talk about, it seems like there's a period where everyone is, number one, readjusting to the relationships because we're always going to view our children as our children. And our children are always in a pursuit of having their independence and finding themselves. And I think once the water settles, you could come back and realize that, hey, you are now an adult. Uh, the relationship with mom and dad, retro, in a retro, retro, retrospectively, you could say, now I know what you were talking about. And there's an, I think there's a new appreciation for that new relationship that has been established, you know, with them. Yeah, I've, I've definitely come to that point with, with my parents and, um, and they've been giving me advice about um, my own children. Um, my, uh, my wife and I have two daughters and our oldest daughter just started at NYU. Nice, nice, uh, nice. So she's nice. here in the city. Okay, daddy girls. <laughs> you, know, you know, are they at the stage of, you know, well, you're a cool dad, but are they at the stage of, you know, hey, hey dad, get lost. <laughs> well, I think that um, no matter what, I do. I'm not going to be cool to them. Um, <laughs> they call me boomer. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, they, you know, they're, they're very smart, um, independent girls who I know are going to do great things in the world, but they're, uh, especially our older daughter, she's, she's pushing her independence and, um, and she wants to, you know, blaze her own trail. And I, I, I admire that. Do they know who you are to the world? Yeah, they definitely understand who, who I am. And, in, mm -hmm. you know, and in some ways they, um, they appreciate it, but in other ways they, you know, they think that I was always too busy and, um, mm -hmm. and, and they, um, you know, when they're being mean, they say, oh, you do a lot of stuff that you claim is altruistic, but it's just, but it's just so you get credit for it, which is really narcissistic. Mm. And mm. I say, mm. well, you know, there are ways narcissism can be worse, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's a, there's, a, there's a big sacrifice you make when you share yourself with the globe. You know, our children sometimes believe we didn't share ourselves enough with them. You know, I think about some of those days, some of the games I missed with Jordan, some of the things I didn't do. And, you know, he has learned to understand. But those are some painful periods of when you are so much in the public life that you're not there in the private life. Yeah, well, I'm, um, I'm always hoping that eventually they'll understand the, um, 
that, that, that the effort was for, you know, them and for the greater good, but, um, but no, our family life wasn't typical. And, um, you know, my, my wife and I love them very much and always tried to show them support, but, but yeah, there, I, I think that the, the amount of time that my work takes and the amount of energy and attention I have to give to the, the rest of the world is unusual. Well said, well said. I am so happy, uh, Shepard, you joined us from the streets of Joe Bird to the streets of New York City. Uh, you made street art um, part of our lives, and I thank you for that. We, we're a better city because you use art to express yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for having me, and I love the New York City art life. Thank you. And this is the information I wanted to share today. I hope to see you for another episode of Get Stuff Done Cast.